Welcome to another figure week, park surface week, organic week. Hey everyone, my name is Ahmed al -Douri. I'm a concept artist and former instructor at Art Center College of Design, Brainstorm, CCS, CGMA, and various other places. And I would like to introduce to you this digital painting course that I've created. But before we get into anything, I just want to thank you for the support you've all given me this whole time. And with the support of so many of you, I've been able to put together everything I know about painting into this digital painting course. You want to become a pro, illustrator, concept artist, or even just a hobbyist, but you don't have a clear map to get there. And that's where I come in. I spent the last six months compiling everything I know from my 20 years of art practice, and I've turned it all into a map. Starting with foundations such as rendering shapes, color theory, painting basic subjects, understanding brushwork, brush economy, all that fun stuff, deconstructing the skull, drawing it from every angle, all the way to master studies, stylized painting, and you'll find yourself at the end of the course doing a concept art project based on everything that we learn in the first 14 lessons. So how does it work? Well, you sign up, you watch the lectures, do the assignments, Post them to the community page if you want and treat it as a self-study, except for those of you who have signed up for the weekly meeting where I personally critique your work in a virtual classroom setting. I believe learning by repetition is super important. That's what I've sort of presented a lot in this course and the assignments are tailored for that as adapted for my time teaching at Art Center. And each of these lessons have step-by-step -step explanations in real time. If you've ever seen my videos, you know exactly how I teach. And this course is intended to be a substitute for a college level course but you don't have to pay the four or $5,000 per class, racking up maybe 200K in debt. With my custom design course, you'd be paying a fraction of that. And of course, I also have payment plan options if you don't want to pay for the whole thing at once. Thank you for watching this and I'll see you soon. Hey guys and welcome back to Digital Artcast, um, another episode coming at you thick and fast off the back of our last one with Lauren Lanning. Um, it's been a little bit of a gap between episodes, um, generally just things going on in the world and then my schedule has meant that I haven't had um, as much time as I wanted to this month so um, I'm always looking to get an episode out at least once a month. Um, I've tried to do that consistently for a long time and um, yeah, just again, trying to get people's schedules aligned has always been difficult because uh, the world is the way it is and people are obviously busy with loads of projects and, and, and the, the work and, and time and everything else in between. Um, but again, uh, we have uh, put together another great guest for today, um, someone that um, I've looked to speak to on the podcast for um, quite a while. Um, again, try to align schedules is always difficult, but we've got there in the end. Um, so yeah, today, uh, let me introduce um, our guest. Uh, Mr. Eric Nielsen. Hey, Eric. Thank you. Hey, hey, man. Yeah, hey. Nice to be uh, here. Yeah, yeah, good to have you here, man. It's It's been a long time coming. It feels like it's uh, one of these things where um, I think we started talking really early on through our kind of uh, common friend, uh, Johan. Yeah, that was like, what, ages ago? Like, yeah, but three years ago or something like that. Yeah, yeah something probably crazy. more than that, really. Uh, Eric yeah. was uh, someone who just jumped into a painting night one night. We were just kind of doing a study 
and uh johan was like oh here's my buddy eric they were going to do some painting i was like oh cool like yeah we'll hang out and, and chat and uh now you're a big fancy art director at a major game studio <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's kind of crazy it's been a really wild ride the last few years but um you've earned it man you've, congratulations Thank on you. our success so far and, and yeah congratulations on the game it's it's, it's been a, a huge success also so yeah it's been... yeah thanks yeah it's gonna be uh really fun to see where we're, you know how high we can take it kind of. yeah of course um so for people who don't know you um can you give a little brief uh introduction of who you are and what you're doing yeah absolutely uh yeah so my name is eric i uh studied game way back like i i started studying like uh game development and and art and stuff when i was um like 15 16 or something uh and then i i went to uh the, the game assembly there's a big uh big game school in uh, malmo in sweden where we do yeah, it's like a pretty intense uh, education you do like um two years full-on projects like uh not really a lot of theoretical work more like practical work yeah yeah uh, it's a really, really good school. And then, um, then after that, I did my internship at Massive. Uh, nice. Well. So I did some um, worked on some concept art for the division uh, way back. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of a funny story because I actually got my internship at uh, another studio that I uh, I really wanted to do my internship at uh, called Southend. At the time. Right. Um, and then uh, a lot of smaller mid tier games but they have like a fun like i anyone that knows me knows that i i love you know creature design and mm -hmm. more fantastical stuff and, and things like that and, and they had like a good mix of all that stuff so i was really excited i think like um I, a week or two after uh, uh i got the um the internship there uh, you know i hadn't really heard anything and then the guy uh, called me up and said yeah, so the studio uh, studio is no more. <laughs> yeah, uh, do you want to? Yeah, I was like, yeah, uh, but we're all getting uh, bought up by Massive. Do you want to tag along? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. do that instead. Yeah. I mean, Massive in terms of Sweden is one of the biggest studios um, that really exists there. I mean, there are, there's obviously yeah. there's, there's like a good few studios, but Massive is a massive studio. It's funny how the world the, the yeah. name has really matched their, their their scale because Division is such a huge thing now. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. No, but it was uh, it was uh, it was a crazy, crazy thing. Uh, it was sort of a great team to to be a part of. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, even with uh, when Johan when I first met him, I think he was still at um, Dice, um, yeah. doing yeah. some stuff there as well. And they're obviously there in Sweden as well. And worked in Battlefront, you know, um, was one of his, his first gigs before he went elsewhere. But um, yeah, it seems a lot of people who came out of that school really went through really cool projects. Yeah, I mean, there's there's loads of good schools in Sweden. Um, uh, I think well, a big reason for it is that we have the we have a lot of funding for arts. Uh, you know, the different art schools. So there's a lot Sounds of good. yeah, like big uh, big bands, um, like metal bands. Like uh, you've probably heard of a few, like Ghost or In Flames or. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah, I'm a big In Flames fan. Yeah, yeah, I met a lot of Flames. Yeah. 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 Uh, but also, you know, game game developments, loads of good game developments, and one of the best ones I would say is the Game Assembly because it's very um, practical. So, is that the one that Johan also went to as well, or no? I don't think he actually went to that. I think he went to um, I don't know if it was kind of Sof maybe, which is a, yeah. a it was like a kind of the Game Assembly prototype, you could right. say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's it was definitely one of them. I can remember way back in the day they talk about going to something similar after he'd done his formal uh, education, but um, it seems to be a, a a thing that's needed because the skill gap is so huge when you leave traditional school that you kind of need these qualified courses because um, you know unless you want to push that really yourself, um, it, it's hard to find those those mentors or those skills that or those um, opportunities to push your 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 skill set forward. And yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh... I mean, I think one of the most important things is that there's a lot of schools out there that, like, what you really need is you need mentorship and you need, like, the time to actually sit and practice your skill sets. Um, yeah. and, and, and then what you need as well is, like, a good portfolio and, like, how to make a portfolio. And after that, you need to, um, to actually uh, get an internship somewhere or, you know, like, a job, uh, preferably. But... Super uh, simple. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, one day. <laughs> but I think what's, 
What, yeah, what's, so good, I mean, like, what's so good about that school is the fact that they basically have two years. There's no theoretical work, no like necessarily like homework. So Exams speak. and stuff, right? Yeah, you, you work your ass off for two years. Uh, you do eight game projects with, with a team. So you actually like get to learn how to work in teams, how to figure things out. People script their own game engines. You know, like there's, there's so much you do. You do full on shooters or 3D and 2D and everything. And, um, and then at the end of it, you basically have a pretty cool portfolio. And then they do a meet and greet where they invite a bunch of people over from um, the game industry. And you get together and meet them. And there's like 30, 40 companies that come and try and snatch every one of these students. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, I mean, then you, you, you get an internship. Uh, and so that's, that's probably the best thing about school is the connection they have to the industry. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's the same with uh, even big places like if you go on the extreme end, like Nomon, you know, one of their placement rate uh, percentages is something like ninety five percent. But that's because within LA, obviously, you have access to some of the biggest studios in the world, and the guys who teach there typically are already working as well in a studio. So, yeah. you know, if they get a particular student they see has some potential, then they'll just like fire them into the the, mm-hmm. the studio that they're working at. You know, it's it's one of these things where, um, you know these opportunities didn't come along uh often but if you find yourself in the right school at the right time then you know you're almost kind of thrust into that so um yeah yeah but essentially uh, i think like after um so, so i i was a concept artist uh, back then and uh, I've, I've always been a bit of a 3d generalist like i, I love doing uh, rigging and animation and you know, like just learning different things and it's same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and I, I honestly think it's been one of my biggest strengths is uh, like I know a lot of people specialize, especially if you want to work on a AAA studio because right. Yeah, they, then obviously like they they need a guy to do characters. You don't yeah. need to also do buildings, but yeah. uh, but I think like a big reason why I've I've managed to get somewhere, I guess, is. Uh, because I've been had that interest for different different skill sets and different departments, and that ob- obviously means that you can, uh, like, you learn what other people are doing, and you can work really well with a uh, with a team that does different things. So I don't know. Yeah, it's there was like, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the the name of the oh yeah range. There was a really good book, um, by I think it's a David Epps team. Yeah, called Range, and one of my buddies, Derek, uh, Westlake, uh, turned me on it yeah, and. He was talking about it's a it's a book basically how uh, journalists will win out in a, a specialized world, um, and he talks about how you know there's so many people out there who will specialize in one particular thing, but they then fall victim to uh, you know anything outside of their their realm of understanding, um, they become exponentially weaker because you know they, they can't really um, you know duck and weave to, to whatever the, you know the situation that changes because you know if, if they had to do something where their skill set had to be changed like we need somebody to quickly do something else you know they're almost just useless yeah you because know, they're going to do one thing and one thing good so um and obviously people who specialize can obviously sometimes you know they may have a, a, an idea of maybe like oh maybe could do something like that or, or change slightly but if it's too much diverse from what they're doing right now then yeah they kind of they kind of flounder um because it's it's something they haven't prepared for so yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of these decisions I think you have to make early on about what kind of developer you want to be. You know, do you want to go all in in one skill or do you want to have a, a wide gambit of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's not like you have to either, uh, like you can also be, oh, I love doing characters and that's going to be my main thing. But then I'm also interested in doing something else and uh, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. And I like, you don't have to be a master on every skill either. Like, I think that's, that's like an important thing to note is that mm-hmm. I don't have to be an elite, you know, uh, like I, I do bouldering and climbing and stuff. I don't have to be. The, you know the, the best climber in the world right uh, enjoy it yeah yeah but i enjoy it and i, I learned a lot from it and, uh, and i mean why not uh, same thing mm-hmm. you learn a little bit of i don't know design uh then you can you can talk to the concept artist more easily or yeah but in any case i uh from there on i um I worked at Paradox for a bit as a concept artist. I did. Cool. Uh, yeah, I worked on the Stellaris game, did a lot of spaceships and stuff, which was fun. Um, and then after that, uh, I uh, I got actually a, a friend of mine, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Cassian, that I've known for a long time. She um, she called me up and she was like, "Hey, me and my friend Joan, we're uh, gonna start the studio." 
is there uh do you want to do you know anyone that would uh want to tag along as an uh art person and i was like oh, i want to tag along as an art person <laughs> <laughs> and then i just uh I joined that train. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I, I always wanted to do like an indie thing so right and was that the the late ridden thing you done yeah so that was like a, a small like mist like uh um puzzle game we did over the course of like uh three years or something right yeah i mean like it looks like online i mean only researched it really quickly but it did look like you know for the um the small amount of time that you you were on it or or you know the, or the thing that you'd say even that it was about you know a smaller game it, it did look like you know no maybe no triple a quality but it did look like it was like there was a lot of effort put in it that it was a big a big project as well so yeah i think it was also like it's one of those projects we would probably do a bit differently if we uh if we did now but uh, with the skill set and stuff we learned, but it's definitely like a, a really fun project and like good learning experience. And I mean, considering we're like five people, it was. Uh, oh people. yeah, well there you go. It's awesome. yeah. <laughs> five people. Like you know, that looks really good. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, with two people doing all the uh, the writing, the puzzle, the, the game design, and the um, the coding, and then uh, wow. me and uh, another guy, Anton, we we did all the art, uh, like Jesus every single. Christ piece um it was uh it was a lot of work uh, especially since it was 3d and you know yeah, like, uh, yeah. so so that was, that was yeah cool. i mean like extremely well done i mean like i mean i know people always say they're quite impressed the fact that the two game jams i done you know there was only three people there was me an artist and two coders um and we had four days and we, we tend to do like it was really cool stuff it, i mean that definitely opened my eyes to a different side of the world because on game jams it definitely does um, give you experience that you're not used to because I think until you finally make something and put it out in the world, you can't really understand the whole development process of of making something. Um, yeah. But yeah, like it's for five people, that's that's very impressive. Yeah, uh, it, was, it, was, it was fun for sure. Yeah. And then of course uh, the big one, which is uh, Shark Mob. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so we 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 ran our little indie company for a while and we still have it, but uh, you know it wasn't enough to uh, to be able to survive on essentially. Of course. Uh, you know. It's it's a uh, I think we 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 kind of joined or we we decided to make a game when um, it was the whole kind of Firewatch and you know like there was all those early um, indie games right that uh, that were doing really well and then uh, you know you had green light and stuff. You know, and um suddenly the floodgates were open kind of on uh on steam and uh yeah and it was pretty hard to to you know like survive on on small single player story driven indie games okay. so uh, yeah yeah so actually i um i knew a few people from shark Mob before uh, i knew rodrigo the studio art director a bit um, okay uh, he was one of the um like the people who founded Shark Mob are the uh, the core uh, the core team behind the division originally. Oh, okay, um, right. And they um, so, so I, I knew him a bit from before, and it, and it seemed like a cool you know studio. I wanted to check out what they did, and and uh, I uh, I got invited up. I think it was me, Sarah, and Joan. We got invited up uh, to their uh, studio back when they had like there were like ten people in like a, a small apartment, uh, and uh, he showed me the video, and it was Vampire Masquerade. And uh, cool. to me, it was like you know I love Vampire Masquerade. I play the Bloodlines like so much. Same. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was like, you know, I, I I was just at that point, you know, I we weren't sure like like. Looking back at it, clearly he was he was like being you know come work for us kind of, but but at that point you know we were still doing like written and stuff, but but it was yeah. just really really cool to see that someone was finally making something with that IP because at this point you know the uh, like Bloodlines two and all of that stuff that wasn't announced there was not like I didn't know anything about that. Of course, so, yeah. Um, so I, this is the first v- VTM game. Like video game that I, I seen someone trying to make the for the last fifteen years or whatever, and I was just super happy that someone was finally doing it. Yeah, vampires kind of had a bad rap for a while because of the whole Twilight thing, and you know, like there wasn't really any um, good vampire IPs coming out, and I think people thought it, it was kind of a passe thing. Like you know, I, I mean, the biggest influences I would say vampire wise for me the last you know couple of decades has been the underworld movies, which mm. were extremely well written well in the first maybe two but um 
you know, I was actually also a very big fan of the Legacy of Kane series, which was Legacy of Kane is my one, one of my all time favorites. Series. Oh, it is. Yeah, like Le- Soul Reaver is just a masterpiece in my opinion. Like, I would love to meet uh, Amy Hennig one day. I mean, I know she spent <laughs> so many years writing, on, writing Uncharted, but her first Crystal Dynamics work and and yeah. Legacy of Kane was just incredible. And yeah, um, Soul Reaver and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, like that whole story for for a long, long time really inspired me. Um, the way that the time travel stuff worked and back and forth and the characters in it and Raziel and um yeah it's informed a lot of stuff I've done so far but yeah like I was one of the big components like when I first got on Twitch I think back in 2014 maybe earlier um at the time Nosgoth was was kind of um in its infancy and I was uh heavily involved in the betas and the open access stuff and trying to really nail that stuff down and uh I was really gutted when that kind of died um and just yeah, yeah. never came back um it was quite it, it was uh it was probably a little ahead of its time actually like if you yep. consider uh yeah, where the industry was heading of course uh, yeah 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 definitely you know just the wrong time the wrong place for that studio but um yeah. but yeah but so obviously when i found out what you guys were doing i was like oh wow you know this could be a whole uh <laughs> a whole new chapter. yeah a whole new chapter of, of the vampire you know pvp stuff and um but an interesting take you guys, you know, kind of went with with the whole um, super powered kind of aspect and the fact that you know it's not a kind of it's PvP in a sense, but it's you know, but obviously in Osgoth it was it was five v five, it was humans versus vampires, but in this thing it's vampire v, v vampire, but it's obviously you've got it specifically between the clans. That's the whole thing now of of uh, you know um, how you've kind of angled it, and obviously the the not just the clans but the archetypes as well that you know. I mean, the whole thing that that works with as well is it, i mean it's super interesting like there's, there's you could probably do a whole podcast in just the game like because there's just <laughs> such depth there right there's just so much um within it because when you say like the 1v100 you know people kind of say oh you know it's been done to death and, and stuff but mm. um i think they get the twist you guys have taken on it is what makes it really super unique right yeah i think i think like uh the best thing about our game is the verticality and the movement system that's that's what really sets it apart i think and and obviously the vampire abilities and stuff but the, the funny thing about our game like blood hunt is that when we started development on it uh and i you know i came in like a year maybe one and a half into the produ- actual production i think yeah. so we were around 34 people when i joined um, oh, wow. Yeah, it was like a, a tiny. We had uh, like essentially one room, mm-hmm. a few meeting rooms, and everyone was just cluttered together. It was it was great. I, I love that part of the yeah, development. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I think one of the coolest things about that thing is that so so Apex wasn't out yet. Right. There was no basically. Um, I think during our early days, Fortnite turned from. A uh, from the the original game that it was from a survival thing, yeah, yeah, to actual the battle royale game. So so you know it's 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 kind of funny when you think about game development because it takes so much time and all you can do is sort of say we think this is going to be good in a few years, right? And yeah. this is a good idea. Let's let's go for it. And then yeah, yeah. you know uh, by the time you release it because uh-huh. it takes so many years, you're like you know oh okay yeah. There was a bunch of other games that thought the same, and now yeah, we have yeah. to compete with them. Oh, <laughs> but, of course, yeah. yeah. But then, of course, they open the space and the doors for for you know that audience to come in because yeah, then absolutely. again, as soon as people look at it, they think, "Oh, I know this type of game. I've I've played this before. I've played you know Fortnite. I've played Apex. I've played whatever." Um, and uh, and yeah, like it, it does, it helps. But then again, at the same time, like you say, th- those people are then your direct competition. So then you're trying to fight for those player bases because you know you're wanting them to come play your game and um. I think it's one of these things where um, you guys were on a definitely a winning streak, but then it's also where these things we like, you know, vampires are super niche in a sense where, you know, you're not get everybody, your common Call of Duty player would, would maybe be into playing as a vampire. Like they'll be like, oh, vampires, you know, what's going on? But, you know, it's 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 trying to get a mass appeal to a very niche subject. I mean, even in any medium, vampires is definitely a, a niche. But um, yeah, same with werewolves, same with mermaids, same with anything really that's the, of that fiction. But, um, but you guys seem to be doing well. I mean, it's it, it, every time I see it, your player base seems to be getting larger and larger. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, uh, we we just have to keep going, kind of. But but I, I think what's kind of interesting about it is that um, early on, when they were originally uh, looking at the concept, and you know, should we do this or should we not do this? Yeah, yeah. I think one thing they looked at is that 
there is a few of these tropes that keep kind of coming back into the general public that are these kind of strong of uh, stories uh, or strong fantasies. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them is vampires. One of them is like post-apocalyptic Mad Max. Uh, you of know, one of them is pirates. There, <laughs> there's a there's a bunch of these you know fantasies that that keep they, in mind. Yeah, yeah, they do cycles. They they never really go away. Yeah. Um, and and I think vampires is one of those. If you look at the massive amount of of um, stuff that's been coming out the last yeah. few years, you know, and obviously you got the big ones like Blade and Underworld, oh, yeah. but you also got Lost Boys and like a bunch of like smaller kind of st- or like you know less known to the general yeah, public. Yeah, of course. But, so I'm I'm I think it's definitely like one more niche thing, but it's mm-hmm. it's not that at the same time yeah of course there is an audience for it yeah i mean well twilight in a sense was a vampire film but like yeah the the audience for for that was there was millions of people that watched those films i mean there were huge audiences and um but one of my first experiences watching um vampire films when i was really young was uh, probably an age i shouldn't have watched it was interview with a vampire oh yeah tom cruise so yeah like a lot of people i think have romanticized vampires uh since bram stoker's stuff way back in the day um and uh even castlevania recently where yeah. uh, her house remaking that series like it was fucking incredible dude like it was such a good animation um, yeah, a, there's a lot of vampire stuff coming out right now there's uh, obviously all the vtm games and uh yep. blood hunt and then there's yeah. uh I, th- I think like another swedish developer who made like a vampire like a, a small yeah yeah of, uh... they were just in the news <laughs> they were in the news recently for not great reasons <laughs> but yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah there was a whole thing came out basically about um how it, the game had been super successful but they basically weren't paying people who were working for them um oh, yeah. so yeah i think it's a french studio i think that made that one um but uh but yeah yeah there is there is a ton of stuff coming out and it's uh and then obviously the masquerade like there's uh you know bloodlines 2 is still Duty be coming out at one point as well, so um, um, so that will be a whole thing. Hopefully, that might then reinvigorate your audience again because you know the, the licenses are, are are tied within the same universe. So um, but hopefully, would give you guys another another boost um, um in player base and 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 then obviously uh, uh media cycle as well. You know for for stuff that's uh, related to that. So yeah, I mean it's it's a whole thing that um, I think like you said, the verticality is one of the things you need to get right as well, and and the art direction is is crazy good as well. Like I think it's one of these things where it was difficult right because um like you said you know the masquerade game the original one that we all kind of played back in the day at this point was like early 2000s when it came out and yeah, yeah, yeah. art direction especially even just games have just evolved so much right like bringing that ip into the 21st century must have been a whole team effort of course it yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it was uh it was uh, it was very interesting like uh one of the, the the key things we wanted to to look at when we looked at the original art direction was uh, obviously it's a 90s game and we wanted to do a little bit more of a like a modern take on it with the you know a little bit of an hbo like style almost you know like uh, yeah, yeah like the, the sort of uh, we have this thing we call the the blood flow which is the uh, it's one of the trailers is like entirely made in blood flow or, or the intro the intro video it's on youtube right. and um and it's it's this it's almost like one of those kind of hbo intros oh, yeah, it's yeah. like uh, like you're in, in a microcosmos of blood sort of and yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of cool cool ideas and cool stuff we did but the funny thing about you know the 90s and fashion and stuff uh, is that ultimately it's coming back, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, of course. Right, yeah. right now we're in like an early two thousands uh, trend era, right again. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting how that kind of keeps going. Everything comes around in cycles. Yeah, I mean, like definitely, you look at the art world in general, and and it's just kind of taking ideas from the originally where they were, and then recycling them, and then putting out, you know, trying to make something new of what was and what could be. And um, I think with vampires, it's, it's definitely generally harder as well because not every vampire is the same like you said when you start to introduce like the clans especially like they all have their own look you know like the bruja and stuff and nosferatu like they all have their own particular style and drape and and um you're like um yeah like it's one of these things where you're designing just a myriad of characters on different styles and different you know class levels and stuff like that it's 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 a lot of work, um, especially when your game is so heavily character based, right? It's kind of like uh, Overwatch or Apex, like you said, when you have champions. Like it's the same kind of thing where, you know, every one has to feel unique, right? Every single one has to feel like they can exist on their own and then their own person. Um, I, I mean, it's something maybe you guys have done um, in a sense where 
you've not done the kind of champion thing where like every vampire is its own character right it, uh, they have like a backstory a, a whole thing going on it's more just like the clans are more the focus than the actual the individuals right yeah and i mean i think one of the one of the interesting things partly is that vtm is what what's cool about the clans is that this, there's essentially a vampire for everyone right you know there's you want to play the big kind of tough warriors but like with the nobility and bravery and you know like then then you got the bruja if you want to play a blood sorcerer you got tremere if you want to yeah, play you know and so on like pretty vampire you got the torador yeah, uh, yeah there's there's a bunch of these different uh archetypes and you know different different clans and that's really the strength of the, the ip i think um but what's sort of cool about it is that uh when we started working on it like you know like it was a lot of work but but it's you know, like there, there are already already so so strongly defined styles and looks that it's a, it's more a matter of how do we interpret this and and you know obviously why with respect to the source material and of course. stuff and yeah. yeah it was a lot of fun for sure and it's gonna be a lot of fun as we add more and more clouds to the game. Yeah, it was one of these things that every time I met up with Johan at an event, I was <laughs> I was saying, how's the mysterious IP project that you can never talk about going? He was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> As if, you know, for the longest time you're saying to yourself, what the fuck are you working on? It must be something yeah. really good. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'll be really just waiting. And uh, yeah. when I announced it on that Halloween uh, last year, was it two years ago now you announced it? Or last year? I can't remember like now. Last year. It would have been, yeah. yeah. My, my brain is a blur at this point. Yeah, I'm the same. Uh... The days are merging together. But, um, but yeah, like... Um, that was I was it totally caught me by surprise. I was like, "Holy shit!" Like, you know, I actually think there's a there's a clip of me in, on Twitch reacting to it, um, when you guys announced it, and I think it was, was it the Game Awards or or one of those things. Yeah, uh, Game Awards. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was watching, and then I was like, "Oh, Shark Mob, here we go!" Right, cool, cool. What's happening? And uh, I saw the trailer. I was like, "Oh, holy shit, vampire!" <laughs> 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 yeah, totally unexpected. Because like you said, that you know the game hadn't existed and really, had, or like that IP hadn't existed for such a long time. I think it yeah. did catch people by surprise that were like. Uh, well, there was two ways that I seen on YouTube. It was like people reacting to it, like "Oh my god, vampire!" because they were old enough to remember the, the original game, yeah. and then also people being like "Vampire the Masquerade." What the fuck is this? You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 never yeah, heard yeah. of it before. So, um, yeah, yeah, and also like kind of uh, people being sort of "What the fuck have you done with my favorite IP?" Which is which is also <sighs> like a yeah. you know a fun thing because yeah i mean i kind of get that you know like I, I personally like i'm i'm uh everyone expects a different game than you give them yeah but it's also like you know it's the strong single player roots and stuff and, and yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah, what, yeah. what we're really trying to do is show that we we love the ip as well and we respect it and we just want to there's like there's enough room in the uh in the ip for more than one kind of story to be told in right, a way yeah. And, yeah and if you look at the like most VTM games are going to be the classic sort of, um, you know, vampires in political, you know, like societies. And there's like, a, you know, a way more slow paced and more manipulative kind of story going on. And this is, this is just a sort of the all out war scenario that happens, right. but it happens rarely. Yeah. I mean, like the whole, even people when they, they look at the name they they, un, they don't understand what the masquerade is right and it's it's no. something that people don't take into consideration about vampires in modern day society about how they have to hide from humans and yeah. it's a whole thing like if you break the masquerade you know you can, can die and stuff like that but um that is something that was key in gameplay as well it wasn't just something you talked about like it was an actually a current thing that happened within gameplay if you broke it you know you'll get like a red mark on your back like people will be after you like you can't break the masquerade it's still a thing that's going on even during wartime um so it's like a whole thing you guys brought into that as well which is great because then it's again like you said it's staying so close to the source material and yeah. um being faithful to what the game is or the story the, the lord is really about so yeah yeah and i mean I, I i love i really love this like ip it's it's such a cool world and it's it's essentially a basis for a lot of the game, like movies that i love like underworld and yeah and uh blade so being able to work on it is kind of like a dream country dream like when i when i was a kid there was like you know, when I first played World of Warcraft, I was like, MMOs are great. Uh, mm -hmm. If I could work on an MMO in my lifetime, yeah. that would be amazing. And and I'm kind of working on that now. Like, we're not quite yeah, an yeah. MMO or anything. We're, we're a VR game, but we're still like a live service, multiplayer, mm -hmm. multiplayer game. And mm -hmm. we have the opportunity to be able to take this game and actually, you know, 
evolve it over multiple seasons. There's so much crazy shit. I know. Well, I was I was just going to say that people talk about like the whole you know how Masquerade is so rooted in single player, but the thing is as well that um, if you look at Apex even back in the day, and like we yeah. just talked about Fortnite, right? When that first started, about what that looked like in versus now, but fucking Spider Man and Naruto and everything, <laughs> like, you know. But like you know, if you look at those things as they evolved, they changed so dramatically and. Even Apex initially, the champions weren't what they are now. Like, you know, the whole thing with the stories and every time there's a new season, there's a new cinematic explaining stuff. And um, there's always room if the game does well and you evolve it to constantly change how you guys deliver the service and, you know, expand on, on that whole thing as well. And honestly, I think like one of the most fun things is actually working on, like, I really like working on live service games it's stressful and crazy and you know like you're like i think the thing that people don't consider is that you're not just working on the content that's coming out next week you're working on you're essentially splitting yourself in three like you're working Mm -hmm. on the game as it is right now you know potential problems that arise bugs you know what's like uh making sure that the store is working and all those things and Mm -hmm. and supporting the players as things are coming developing patches fixes and all kinds of stuff but then you're also working on what's coming next you're working on the upcoming stuff right and then you're also working on what's coming next next you know and what's coming next 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 essentially like you you have to keep working uh, on multiple levels in into the future because yeah, you're gonna get there pretty fast like you know game yeah. development takes time and four months between you know whatever releases or something as it usually is with live service games or four five six months i don't i don't know it depends on what sort game but all of those are uh you know like all of that is essentially very little time to actually do anything all right yeah uh, I mean, if you know how, how long time it takes to, because cause it's not just, you know, it's not the waterfall. Like, you don't develop games waterfall. You don't develop games by, and if you don't know what waterfall is, yeah, like, you you know, obviously, but, <laughs> you know, a waterfall is the, the idea that you, you plan something out to perfection and you say, this is exactly the game we're going to make and do, do, yeah. do, do. And then you execute it and it just goes down like a waterfall. Yeah, that, yeah. It doesn't happen in software development. It's like a river rapids tour. That's what it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a freaking and there's twists and turns and you iterate yeah. like iterate a lot on things and you. The only thing you can do is say, "This is probably the best direction." This is our guess mm-hmm. is that this is going to be good, and then you try that. And many times you say, "Yeah, that was almost correct." Sometimes it's not correct at all. Sometimes you fail catastrophically, catastrophically, and you, yeah, you have to, you know redo your your assessment and your plan and scrap things and stuff but yeah it's uh it's a it's a pretty wild ride but i i really like it uh, yeah I, I, mean, I think that's uh, good with I, I mean it happens it happens so much within you know even within game jams and, and the turnaround for that's even shorter but mm-hmm. you know it's leaving the waterfall effect it's the thing where like you can go back up the waterfall you know you could design a character really early on and then you feel like right okay this is the iteration and you've you, you've you know, you've designed it so many times that you're kind of you're seeing double and then it goes back down to production who make even get them maybe get to the point of making the first model and then they're sitting saying oh, you know it's not really working something's missing and then you have to go all the way back to sketching again like you know yeah. it's one of these things where you think to yourself right that's done shipped off and then you start working on something else and something comes back to you that you've, you've worked on months ago and you're like oh god like you know like <laughs> try to get your brain back in that that mode of like oh, where was that when i made this guy like what was i thinking about and yeah it's yeah that's also a, a a a complication even when you design levels around things that you think will be fun and then you play it and you're like oh shit man this isn't fun <laughs> like, <laughs> what do we do now fuck you know we've only got a couple of weeks or something or yeah um, yeah and I, mean, I think that's one of the the most challenging part is when you're just like this has to be out and uh and and you know tested in in two weeks mm-hmm. you know how do we solve this issue because you know it's not just like you know it's it's not just uh you make the thing and then you release it no like you you have to make it in in like in good time so that there's a buffer window which is almost like half the production for you know qa quality assurance to check for bugs because (laughs) yeah and and yeah exactly and and like um you know stability for the coders to actually make it stable enough to run properly and i mean the, the the bugs that you see in games that's the stuff that 
you got through the net the wide nets i mean most most of the stuff is is just destroyed before it reaches you but if you don't yeah. have that quality assurance time then i mean there's some things even things you can just never plan for like people just walking off your maps entirely like with some things yeah. that are, you know collisions and stuff are off and you're just on the wrong totally wrong side of the map or they crash the game because of it and you're just like how how the hell like yeah, where did yeah. come from like you know it's um i mean definitely some of my earliest friends in the industry were the guys at cd project and you know the whole thing with cyberpunk you know and 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 it's a shame because i know how hard they worked on the art direction i know a lot of the guys like Marek and stuff who really killed themselves making that game look amazing and you know it was just the whole press release of that first cycle was just all the bugs like people just they couldn't talk about anything else yeah. and um it's one of these things when you work in games you know you could make the best art ever and it looks like the prettiest game in the world but like if it plays like shit <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you're fucked there's nothing you can do you know and, and first impressions are usually the only thing you'll ever get you don't get a, a really a, a good chance of it you know oh, no. i mean there's definitely examples of games having a, a second wind but it's rare right yeah yeah, yeah even games like um what's that called the uh, the space game uh, a couple of years ago that, oh that yeah is... uh uh oh, fuck. no one's guy no one's yeah, guy. yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause like that game i was so stoked for that i was so pumped for that yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you know like all the all the problems and everything and of course, yeah yeah i i i didn't feel like buying it after that but yeah. um look at it now like yeah, wow yeah it's really cool i mean i'm was, happy i'm really happy for 100 percent. yeah i mean hollow games i think i've really turned that out. i mean but it was funny when sean he did a talk about it recently um i mean good on him like hey but he talked about how when they released that game the press was so negative and there was so much just darkness in the world that over that what was that what had happened yeah. that uh they basically just shut the doors and the windows and just were like right cool let's get to work on the game let's finish it let's make it good and then just you know like everybody turned their twitter off direct all oh, the hate mail to me i'll deal with it let's just finish making the game let's get it done and they done it they basically just shut their doors and delivered on what they originally promised it took them a while obviously but um yeah, yeah, I mean, like, there's definitely so many people I think would have cut and run and, and yeah. never went back. So, no, I think it's awesome. I think they they did an awesome job. Um, yeah, definitely. And it's one of these things, like you said, it's when it's a live game and you know you're not delivering a single player experience. You're not kind of like putting it out into the world and like there you go, it's done. Enjoy. You know, you're constantly clipping things over and changing things and updating and tweaking. You know, every tiny little bit of gameplay that um that you you get feedback from the players and we need to change this and change this and then that goes out and then the patch you release might you know fix one thing but break three other things so you're like oh shit you know and it's yeah live service games are um they're, they're, a, they're a different beast you know like there's uh eventually when you've worked on a live service game long enough most people are like oh what i wouldn't give to work on a single player game right now you know like multiplayer <laughs> single player uh, game and then you're like oh i want to work on a live service game again <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 i mean that's that's how it is yeah, yeah. but, uh, but, but i just uh I, yeah, yeah. I really love the I really love the live service part. I I like that you can work directly with the players. You can you can work your ass off to produce something cool. You put it out, but you, and you have a clear deadline. It's like this shit got to be out in like four months or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or whatever. And then you work on that. You put it out, and you get to see what people think and hope hope that they like it. I mean, that's that's yeah. the thing, right? But but uh you know you have that versus working five years in pre-production hell on a game yeah. that might not come out or or uh, you know like yeah. it's and it will be changed like every single game it gets changed yeah. at least five times almost completely like in in, in pre-production that's like the more it, common tale in our industry that's more what happens than the kind of fantasy you've lived where you've actually worked on something that's came out and it's been successful yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. exactly very rare so yeah. but, but then mean, again yeah i was yeah, going to yeah. say like for you for you being an art director as well for the maybe not the first time but like it was your proper first big like major studio role as an art director like yeah. was that intimidating for you like i mean considering you hadn't had like such a huge thing before right like on, not on that scale right Definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, if you're, I, I remember um, talk to uh, I talked to Rodrigo, the our, our studio or my boss, the studio art director. Uh, when I when I became uh, art director, um, I think when I first became associate art director, and and he was like, he was asking me how I was feeling about it, and I was like, 
you know, I'm not going to lie. I feel a bit, you know, intimidated by it. And it def definitely feels like I have um, uh, a little bit of, uh, what's it called? Um, imposter syndrome. You, yeah, yeah, imposter yeah. syndrome, yeah. And he said, if you didn't have imposter syndrome, I would be very worried. Of course. <laughs> so, no, no, 100%, uh, I agree. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Which, which I think is definitely, definitely how it should be. Like, uh, so, so yeah, it was, it's definitely intimidating. It's, uh, there's a lot of things counting on... Uh, yeah, like, you deliver and, yeah. yeah but like i mean it's the whole team right it's not just it's not me like i i think but but there's definitely like a lot of responsibility uh, one thing that that i think is great about the way we work and the way we want to work with uh with our our people uh is that our job as art directors are not to boss people around of course we're we're there to make sure that like if if you think of like a racing track you know like mm -hmm. The team is the people driving the cars. We're we're the mechanics, you know. We're course, we're yeah. there to help them when they need help, to make sure that they they have what they need in order to uh, to do their best out there. Uh, and and th that's how it should be, I think. Like the we we should be the ones we're supporting. We're the support role. You know? Yes. Um, so I mean, so that's, at, that's been really fun. Yeah, you look at most marketing and management courses that revolve around teams. It's like every management role is always to serve the people you're working for you, you know you're working for them essentially is what is you know it's what people will always say that's the thing that always comes down to every single course i've ever seen when people go into talking about managing people it's that you know you're not bossing them about you're you're working for them you're making sure that they have everything they need to do their job and more yeah. um like uh, my friend Sarah, uh, the funny thing is both Sarah and Joanne, who uh, who I started the studio with, uh, well, but back when we were doing our little indie studio, right. they uh, they are both on Shark Mob now uh, as well, and um, Sarah's producer and Joanne is a uh, lead uh, gameplay programmer, I think, or lead programmer. Yeah. Um, but what what Sarah is usually says is that a producer is a person that they're they're like the the snow you know snowmobile that's or like what's it called like when you're like the the big kind of you know machine going and, plow? and huh? snow plow you mean like... yeah yeah snow plow yeah exactly yeah they're, they're producers are like the snow plow they're, they're essentially just clearing yeah, the road so that yeah, yeah, yeah. you know everyone can can do their stuff or that's how it should be really um, mm. and uh, I think that's a good analogy for uh, also for what I do essentially yeah I mean it's great in these kind of companies where you know, I think if the culture is good enough, you feel that you can you can not only enter it with, with a bit of positive attitude that you're going to be appreciated uh, as an individual, but also you have an opportunity to move up and on and, and, and do different things and, you know, explore new disciplines. And I mean, like we were talking about, you know, our common friend, Johan, um, who we met through and, you know, he has now went from UI to concept, you know, like yeah. he made the jump and um, which is great for him because, uh, I know that was something he was chasing for a long, long time. You know, he was enjoying his role in 2D, like uh, as a UI artist, uh, which is crazy because, uh, you know, those people are so in demand, like crazy. Like, you know, you just, you know, yeah. like, you can't find them anywhere. But um, concept I, was... that, I mean, that was essentially like the biggest reason why it didn't go faster, I think, for him, because he was doing such a good job, essentially. Of course, yeah, and yeah. We, we really needed him uh, to help out with UI because it's, Makes sense. it's so hard to get people, uh, especially people that are technical and so on. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it, I'm really happy that he finally managed to, like that we, we, we got enough people hired to handle the UI department so that right. he could, he could Move on. make yeah. the transition because yeah, it's been a long time dream of his. I mean, it's one of these things where, I mean, we talked about this um, off air before we started recording about how, you know, you were um, impressed about following my journey with, with the 3D and stuff. And, and thanks for that, by the way, that's, mm -hmm. that's always a great thing to hear. Um, but 2D is always at the back of my mind as well. And I think it's one of these things that a lot of people always have this dream of being concept artists and concept designers and um, even just illustrators. And uh, I'm always trying to ask myself question, why is that important to me? But um, I think it's the, the idea that you can create worlds and stories from your imagination. I think it you can do it in a sense with 3D, but I think being able to put pen soul to paper and, and create that whole illusion yourself, I think is something that's rare. But when I was talking to Marek Maggi uh, the other day from CD Projekt, he was saying that he was talking to one of his students and he said, 
that um, the concept world now is almost as difficult as trying to get work as an actor. You know, ah. would you feel that's fair? Um, I think to a certain degree, uh, I think the main thing about concept art that is really confusing people uh, mm. is that a lot of people see these really great paintings, you know, and they see these amazing work. Um, on Promotional stuff, the market and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and that's kind of my point as well. A lot of times it is the promotional work. It's the it's things that have been polished up afterwards to sell the game or, or in any or in some cases, you know, like um, they hired basically a really, really good freelance artist like Jamie Jones. Uh, or, oh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jamie is like my old time. Hi, then, Jamie. Then well done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like if I could work with Jamie on anything, I would be happy. Oh, God, happy. Yeah. But uh, in any case, um, um, yeah, like. Um, uh, if he, you're hiring these guys to do your illustrations, then yeah, they're not going to be concepts in a sense that you're doing concepts, no, right? No, exactly. I mean, they still they they can still do the work, like of course. They're still oh, designers, yeah, yeah. like but capable. they're yeah, but but they're not like the kind of work that you see. Those big paintings, they're there to set a mood, uh, you know, general feeling for the team to rally around. They're essentially like a vertical slice or or a, you know, like constant movie, but. I think what's cool about it is that, um, or, or like what what people are confused about is that they see these amazing images and then they're like, "That's what I gotta do." Yeah, and I have they, to be that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also that they they sort of they miss out on the whole idea that that it's about design. That's why mm-hmm. you're a concept artist. And a lot of people that I see in the industry, sadly, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think are necessarily designers, or they're they're not schooled as designers, at least. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, for me, it's like, yeah, great that you can paint an awesome painting. I want to, you know, we, we, you always need one person that can do that, or you, you, you will need that. But of a lot of times, we take in freelancers to do that. Like the, mm. the main thing that's important for us is that uh, you can design things because it's going to be like, hey, we need this new outfit, we need this new, we're making, uh, you know, whatever, like this prop new or weapon this weapon, or, yeah, costume, yeah, yeah. You need to figure out how this thing works how it's going to shoot you need to talk to the game design team you need to talk to the vfx artist you need to and you need to do the research you need to do the design you need to do everything does and, it fit in the art direction does it fit in the world yeah, does it fit with yeah. people you know like even when you concept design like a gun like you know what does the safety look like what does the trigger look like why would it look like that well because the guy's fired it 500 times and maybe it's maybe custom fight for his finger because he's so powerful that he needs a custom grip because you know like this is like the problem solving aspect that I think like you're talking about people miss with concept design and that's why obviously now I think even people don't call them concept artists anymore it is concept designers because you're designing and you're problem solving on a daily basis for, for your team yeah yeah and then that's the that's the whole thing you're supposed to make sure as a concept designer that you know like this is this like it's communicated to the player that it's exciting for the player that it's uh, and, and that all the other teams have what they need in order to design things. So, I mean, sometimes concept designing can simply be, mm-hmm. shit, we need a, uh, we need a VFX. Yeah. And that could be that you, you find references, you create mood boards, you do quick overpaints, you do red pens, you know, and that's all the work you need to do because your work is not going into the game. Your work is making sure that other people's work go into the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, um, I've even seen guys who are concept designers have had to turn their hand to storyboards really quick, you know, just to get something out. You know what I mean? Like it, it just depends where you're needed. And I think with that concept design job, sometimes you just have to be like almost a jack of all trades, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think it's it's one of those things where it's uh, concept design is, uh, yeah, it's definitely like, um, it's definitely hard. Mm-hmm. But I think the main thing behind that for me at least is mm-hmm. that it's hard to find designers you know people that are actually interested in designing things and are yeah. trained to be designers yeah. rather than people that like painting because painting there's plenty of people that like to do of course yeah. but no, it, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a very clear thing i think we talk about in the, the show often and we have since since day one is that there's plenty of people who can draw pretty pictures but then it's how is that functional how is that helping the team how is that cohesive and the vision that we're trying to create and it's uh, it's difficult. It really is something you have to um, build over a couple of years and and maybe even decades of, of working and stuff. And and uh, and the the job has evolved so definitely from when I first left my job in two thousand and eleven, two thousand twelve. Like 
you know, ArtStation wasn't even a thing. You know, CG Hub was kind of where everybody went. There was a concept art world, but like, you know, the job itself, concept artist, was still very new. And, you know, it wasn't like a a, a, a decades old job. Cause, I mean, because the games industry itself isn't that old when you think about it. Because, you know, compared to like the film industry, like we're yeah. still in the infancy of what will be our, our, our careers, you know, 100 years from now, yeah. how our jobs look. So, yeah, and I mean, it's going to keep changing. Like, that's the, I think that's another thing is that we haven't seen nothing yet. You know, like, it's, of it's, uh, I think, I think being sort of a jack of all trades type of person is pretty useful when you're a concept artist because, uh, it's about communicating ideas fast. And, you know, if you can get your ideas out really quickly, that's really important. Yeah, we were talking about this the other day when we were talking about how close the productions on films are getting towards games now because uh, a lot of the guys I know who work on films now, there's some guys I know don't even draw or paint. They just make everything in 3D and take snapshots because it's so much quicker turnaround-wise, you know, for directors. Like, you know, we need five or six shots by the end of the day. Cool. Give me two seconds. I'll take some photos in Unreal you know, or Blender, you know, whatever's to hand and, and the tools have evolved so quickly. I mean, Jan Urschel and uh, a couple of the guys that I know on that side of it. I mean, even you look at... um uh yava your rev like you know yeah yama sorry um yama's whole production now is making 3d assets for people to use in in, a film production you know so the whole discipline has changed so rapidly um it's almost a lost art now yeah yeah yeah. but it's it's really fun it's i like i i love to see all the you know interesting ways people take their designs and and all the interesting uh directions that they go in with uh with you know their methods and, and stuff um, but i i think like for me it's always more interesting to look at you know i can look at an image and i can be like that's a pretty image but if it has an interesting design as well that's really yeah. more interesting to me personally because i i just i i enjoy to see when people have solved the problem you know uh, uh, there's there's uh, uh there's some TV shows where you see that they really succeeded, and you're like, "Oh, that's so clever! I love yeah. the Expanse, for example, like the way." Oh they, yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing. So. I'm sure they've been tearing things up. I mean, like it's the whole thing with AI now as well, where people talk about, "Oh, you know, AI is coming to get our jobs." And I mean, even the one I've been pre- playing with recently, which is Art Breeder, mm-hmm. um, which makes you know these huge landscapes with just a click of a button, and they do look incredible. But um, you still need to go and you know, like even it's like 50% of the work, you still need to do that 50% to tidy it up and, and make it look like something presentable or something that feels like, you know, there's there's never going to be a sense where like those tools will go away. Even people who talked about, you know, the 3D stuff and we just talked about with Yama and stuff and Yan using 3D for, for film production. It really is a time thing and people say like, oh, you know, drawing's going to go away or painting traditionally is going to go away. Those things will always give you an upper hand. Like if you can draw or paint to yes, an extent and have fundamental foundation skills, um, those will never not be a positive, right? They, those will always be things that can help yeah. you in a pinch. Um, I think also like just design work in general will never go away. Like, because like you said, you still have to make something out of it, even though you have it. But but yeah, you know, it's 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 a, uh, and like you say, it's like we're in a this shift or we're in a constant shift, really. Like with this industry, like there's always new things happening around the corner, and right now we're we're in a, a transition, maybe where yeah. people are learning how to use these new tools mm. and and how to show restraint as well or like you know what to keep from the old and what to keep from the new and yeah i mean these these things will always be tools they'll never be a replacement for fundamental skills or or like you say design language or no it's the same thing with the music industry for example you know? of course like they, it's always been like i remember i saw this interview with uh i think trent Reznor from managed nails where he, he was talking about you know uh yeah i mean there's it's way easier to make music these days technically but mm-hmm. there still hasn't been you know like if you don't have natural rhythm or something yeah, like you're still yeah. going to struggle to make music yeah exactly exactly it's, <laughs> yeah, still, yeah. it's, still, it's still hard work like still creative yeah. work that you have to put in and an ai can probably do it for you but it yeah. will probably sound like a lot of other stuff that an ai has done like you know like it'll, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean there was a whole thing where like we were talking about the art reader program uh that i just i've been using then you know, I was speaking to one of the guys who helped kind of make it at one point and he was saying, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's a great program. You know, if you're staring at a blank canvas, 100%, like it will help you. But um, the, one of the problems he finds with that stuff is that, you know, it'll get to a point where you'll see the same patterns in every painting and people will start to really tell when you're using that as a crutch. And um, 
it's the same with 3D assets, you know, with Megascans, for example, in Unreal, like, you know, there's only so many things you can use within that library before people start to be like, cool, like half your scene is Megascans. Like, you know, did you design anything yourself? You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's got to be a, that, that's why those fundamental skills are key because they give you originality because, you know, you can import a model of like a Japanese shrine or something, but if you hand draw something yourself, then like that's where the uniqueness comes in. That's where the, the appeal, the the thing that makes it look cool, you know, like it's, um, you could copy and paste stuff in and out of, of scenes, but um, then you start to lose the whole aspect of what it is to be an artist, right? Yeah, and I also think that there's a danger. Like, um, I remember when I started, I've never gone to proper art education. You know, like, yes, mm-hmm. like I went to the game assembly, but I'll, half the work I did there was like, um, you know, like that was like 3D work and, and mm-hmm. like essentially learning to work in a teams and stuff more than anything. Yeah, of course. Um, and, Which is a uh, huge skill as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and definitely 50% of working at studio is, is learning how to be in a team and how to communicate with people. Because if you can't do that, then you can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I remember that for me, uh, I was like uh, working a lot with the struggle of that, you know, being a digital artist without having the fundamentals of a traditional artist. Like, you know, I've always, I've drawn, right? But mm-hmm. you, uh, on paper and stuff, but you, I've never done, you know, color theory properly or anything like that. And then you get confronted with all these, now with this infinite world of choices. Of course. And you're just like, how the fuck do I go from, you know, what, what, what does this even mean? How does this yeah. work? Uh, How do you and, Photoshop, bro? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just Photoshop it. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think that's the, that's, that's the whole thing about like, um, today as well, that, that, um, if you, if you basically skip over, if you just go copy paste too much, yeah. um, then you're missing out on learning some of those fundamental skills that will really help you in the, in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I've done a, a, a kind of Maya modeling course recently where I was trying to just build on some of those foundations. And the guy I spoke to who runs the course, um, you know, uh, he was saying that, you know, he, it can take him like 30 hours to teach the course, but it can take you 3,000 hours to master those skills. Like, mm-hmm. you know, just because you've sat and done a course by Craig Mullins or something or watched him paint for a couple of hours doesn't mean you're going to come out of that and, <laughs> and know how to use those skills, uh, no. especially in a real world setting. So. I think it's also one of those things that was interesting about uh, brushes. Uh, you know, if you have, you know the old like, oh, I want to get those Photoshop brushes because they're going to make oh me a smart artist. Yeah. What brush yeah. are you using? The first question every time. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I think I think the point there as well is that uh, you you don't really like you can take a person's brushes, but mm-hmm. those are just customized tools. For oh that yeah, person. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that they have worked with for you know years and if you mm-hmm. don't know how to uh how to properly use those tools then you might as well not use them because they're going to be useless to you like you know you're not yeah. going to get the same you're probably going to get worse results than if you just use what you've already been using yeah um but that's kind of you know that's always interesting i mean like some of the best brushes i've seen are, are ones that really bring texture to paintings i think is the stuff that i find really interesting like i think that's what i love about a lot of your landscape work is like it has such texture. That's really what appeals me towards what you're painting and what you're trying to design. Oh, um, and uh, I think that's one of the things that people miss out is when they start using like the hard rounds and stuff. Like, you know, it's like, it gets to a point everything just looks smudged and it's like, you know, they're, they're blending stuff so much that you're like, oh, you're just losing every piece of detail that you're building. Like you just keep going over and then just making it fuzzy again. Like, you know, it's, people are so uh, scared to commit to lines. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, so, I like working like one layer, honestly. I am I'm, I'm always like uh, you know like traditionally painting basically. Yeah, and uh, if I'm not working in one layer, like for example, now I'm I'm currently working in three layers technically because I have a uh, I have a a layer and then a clipping mask and like a color, but I'm gonna merge that soon. Uh, yeah, 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 because it, it's it's like one of those things where. I like to do it until I decide to merge it. And then I merge it, and then it's like, okay, now this is, you know, I'm not going to really go back anymore because this is better than what I had before. Of course. Um, but but what's cool about it is that you learn that you can always paint the, paint it again. Yeah. You know, like, and obviously some things you want to be a little smart about and save, but of course. in most cases, it's, it's okay. Like, you can you can get away with uh, with a lot of stuff. 
I mean, it's just a thing where I think people are too afraid of, um, you know, making the mistake and then be like, oh, you know, it's ruined now. Like I've done the one mark out of place that it shouldn't be, and I need to go back and redesign the whole thing. It's like, you know, yeah. you know, you can totally, look, <laughs> you can you can brush over it. It's all good. Like nothing's, nobody's going to die. Like you're all good. So. Um, yeah. yeah, it's one of these things where it's even I started embracing just drawing with, with pens more than pencils because uh, it does give you that whole um, commit thing. Like you, you need to be able to commit when you're drawing with like an ink pen, you know, like a biro or a mm. brush pen because, uh, you, you know, you can't erase that stuff. But then it does give you a confidence to not be as um, tame when you're designing stuff and, and your lines will be a bit more bolder and your silhouettes a bit more sharp. I love so, uh, I love brush pens by the way they're great. Oh yeah, yeah. that's the. Uh, it was funny though when we went to meet uh, Kim Jong Ji at THU and uh, they asked him about some of his most irritating questions and one of them was every time was like what was the brush pen he was using like every time <laughs> every single demo we went to every course people were like what's the brush pen you're using I was like fucking shut up <laughs> <laughs> just had enough of it like he was like like who cares like it's a brush pen like you can buy you can buy them anywhere there's so many of them just like pick the one you want and and uh. Because it's a thing where, like, you were talking about brushes, like, it's the same with any utensil. You know, people will look at that and say, oh, you know, I need to get that brush pen or I need to get that brush or pencil or paint on that canvas or use that type of sketchbook or I need to get an iPad Pro because everybody uses Procreate now. Like, it, I think so much of art um, in any medium, especially when you look traditional paintings and painters, um, is that you need to find what works for you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. Like, I think, I think the best thing you can do is just figure out sort of what your preferences are mm -hmm. by just doing it, and then you know, like, you just borrow stuff. Yeah. Like, you see a video, you know, with someone, and they do something cool, and you're like, oh, I want to try that. I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you 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 pick that up and you go for that, and you don't yeah. use all of it. Like, you know, all of that isn't gonna help you. Like, you pick the ones, the things that make sense to you. And then you build your own repository of knowledge, mm -hmm. your own like library, your own way of doing things, and that will be your thing. And I think like uh, one of the earlier things I remember uh, back when you know like concept art was still a thing, like concept art with org and stuff, or or com or whatever it was called, mm -hmm. um, that that people were like, oh, you need to have a style, you know, right? It was the whole. Oh, good, yeah. I think, yeah, I still think to this day it's it's a thing where where people are looking for their style, but your style is you know just how you paint and if you just paint and just find your own way of painting you will have a style eventually like that's just part of it you can't not have a style kind of style just comes from just never stopping like you get to a point where you've drawn so much that you know and you incorporate different things like i love this movie i love this artist or i love this yeah. brush and then you do that over and over and over and over again until eventually you're like all right cool the person i've drawn looks like the person i would draw you know like there's people i can even you know, uh, look at people's work now, and I'm like, oh, I know who that is, like straight away. Um, like Thomas Chamberlain Keane, like when I look at his stuff now, TCK, like every time he puts out a painting, there's a painting that goes up on Facebook, and I'm scrolling, I'm like, okay, well, there's Thomas's new stuff. Like, you know, like yeah. people get to that point, even the same with your stuff, like, you know, you, you'll post like a study or something, like, oh, there's one of Eric's paintings, you know, like it's, it's, you get to a point, and that's why people are like, how do you build style? And it's, it's, it's amalgamating everything that you've ever learned with, from everybody into one cohesive canvas and then eventually you know the, the hundreds of things you've learned from different people um eventually becomes you know it's, it's like life in general you have so many different life experiences from so many people like the person who raised you the person who was your first kiss the person who was the good teacher when you were at high school like eventually 10 20 years later when you come out the other end you're a unique person because of all those things that were you know along the way and it's the same yeah, art. monumental in in, in uh, teaching you how to be uh, yeah essentially basically yeah so um what are these things but then again it's the, it's the mileage you've got to put it in you can't uh, develop an art style by sitting staring at your sketchbook it's uh, uh and we're all get live it and especially especially me like you know it's you know you want to try and uh define your art style you want to try and make headway into what you're doing but um you really just need to sit down and do yeah, the thing and it's a pain in the ass some days. Like, uh, I, I don't think there's uh, any artist who doesn't have days where they're just like, I don't want to paint today. Oh, dude, like, with the fucking world sometimes the way it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, just, you just can't help but like uh, be just bummed out by stuff. But um, it depends how you look at art sometimes. I know people who use art basically to escape, you know, just to, yeah. to, um, to really uh, block out the world and, and um, you know, get on with, with uh, what they want to do. 
Um, I mean, there's also so much stuff that's like for me personally. Like I've been, I've been doing. Um, you know, I I don't I can't just do one thing. Like there's some people that can sit and they can paint forever. You know, like right. like yeah. every day there's a new painting coming out, and it's the mm-hmm. only thing they do is paint, which is you know great if you can do that. I can't do that personally. Like I mm-hmm. because because I I want to do more. Like I I want to do I don't want just want to do a painting. I want to make it come alive. You know, I want to make a game or I want to do a project or, yeah. and and for me it's like half of the art that I do in my spare time is writing art direction documents. Like I, I've, I've written now, I think three big project documents uh, right. in the last few weeks, just because I was like, I have these ideas that I've had for a long time. It would be great to do something with it. But instead of thinking about it, I need to actually, you know, decide what they're going to be. And so I sat down and I, I wrote the proper document and uh, mm-hmm. good practice as well, by the way. Yeah. Um, and I just, uh, you know, that's also like a type of art in a way. Like I, I look at that and I'm like, okay, you know, this informs a lot of on the color theory. This, and that's practice. That's a, it's a different type of practice. But mm-hmm. I mean, there's those kind of things you can do as well. Besides just painting, you can also, I don't know, say the 3D, for example. Or yeah, I think that's one of the things that kind of predetermines people who usually tend to be art directors is that you can kind of turn your hand to anything. Um, because then it means that when you're on a project like yours, you know, like you said, if you need to go and speak to some of the art, to the art team, you know, great, you've got that down, but then like, cool, 3D needs a bit of a hand, right? Okay. Well, I know roughly how we do, you know, I've been in Maya and Blender enough that I know, you know, I can talk to those people in, in their language. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, or VFX needs something, right? Great. You know, okay. Animation needs something, you know, and because you're a bit multifaceted about what you do then sure, you know, like, um, it helps in that aspect that you know you can mold and it's like being able to speak more than one language right like you, yeah, you yeah. get an advantage in a bar because you can talk to anybody um yeah yeah, yeah and i i love it uh, personally like i love that i can i have an insight like one of the best things about my job is seeing what other people make during the day you know it's like you get to see all these cool things being developed by the prop team or the you know the animation team or the character team and you can sort of be a part of a little bit of all of it um and, and that's that's a really cool feeling of like just seeing the whole game grow at the same time from different angles and uh, yeah i love that personally yeah i think it's one of these things where um it depends where you want to go with your art you know i think if you were going to be um purely an illustrator and that's all you want to do with your life then sure you need to spend thousands of hours in your sketchbook or on photoshop and just constantly training that that muscle um but if you're looking to be involved in a team or make something like a game then um the more multi-diverse you are the more ways you can turn your hand to different disciplines then sure that's going to be a a more attractive thing to uh people who hire you than uh than just being skilled in one thing um yeah, so yeah. yeah i think the thing is that i always tell people is that no matter what you want to do in art, there's always going to be a job for you. You don't have to pander to people. You don't have to um, sacrifice things that you want just because you want to work in a team. Um, you'll People will always find a way to incorporate you if you're good enough. And um, yeah, I think it's one of these things as well where I learned early on that, um, you know, I went, I went to a lot of these events in 2016 and watched people like Titus Lunner and a couple of different guys um, who, you know, at that time were trying to draw yeah. some gathering and stuff. And you looked at their stuff and you were like, cool, so I need to make art like that. And uh so much of my early career was dictated by what I thought I should paint instead of what I wanted to paint, right? Yeah, uh, no, I totally get that. Yeah, it's very common. Um, so yeah, so probably a good place to stop. Um, we, we've chatted for about an hour, but um, <laughs> yeah. and I've, I've I've yet to see your results. Um, for those guys who are watching the the now edited episode, um, Eric's been painting in the background while I've been chatting to him. So um the result will be on your screen now but i've yet to see it so i'm sure i'll be like oh that's amazing so i'll just <laughs> i'll just guess whatever you've drawn is really good so yeah it's um, just uh it's just a little character design uh it's actually one of my ip things that i'm just I'm just fiddling around with some nice. thoughts and some ideas and seeing what i can do with uh nice. this we'll see how it turns out i'm i'm not yeah. necessarily that happy with it but it's it's a thing of course, of course. It's one of these things where it's, uh, you know, your mind isn't completely on it anyway because you're obviously talking to me. So um, there'll be a, an element of what it would have looked like if you were just doing it without speaking. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah but yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be fun to, to see it 
uh, in inspiration. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for coming on, Eric, and, and talking oh, chat away. Um, it was it was really good to have you, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, definitely fun to be here, and uh, yeah, we've been talking about this for a long time, so it's, it's, uh, it's good. Fun to finally do it, yeah, man. I agreed. Um, so yeah, if you haven't uh, already, um, I'll leave links to uh, Eric's work if you want to check it out, and uh, all his socials will be below, so you can check his art station and all these different things. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, pop them in the comments. Um, um, you can always get in touch with them as well through our station if you need to. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you'd be happy to, to answer any questions you have. Um, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, also um, with the podcast, uh, thanks to you guys who have stuck about it uh, this long to the end. Um, always appreciate you guys coming along to listen to another episode. Um, if you have any suggestions for any future guests or you want to talk to me about anything in particular about the art cast, you can always check our Discord below um, and join if you want to um, check out some of the artists that are on there. And uh, yeah, you can show your work. You can talk about art, um, anything else in between that comes up. And uh, yeah, that's that, that's pretty much it for this episode. Um, yeah, uh, again, check out the links below. Um, join the Discord. Give us a like and a comment, and uh, make sure to share. And uh, thanks again to you guys for listening. Thanks for for coming on, and uh, see you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.